All right. Good morning, everyone, um, and happy Friday. Looks like it's nine o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started here. Let me let a couple other people in. All right. So again, um, happy Friday. Um, we made it to another one. Yay. Um, it's never a good sign when you, you wake up and you hear on the news that there's a major IT outage and you have to um, you know, have a presentation in the next couple of hours. So I was a little concerned about what <laughs> we might be um, waking up to, but it looks like everything's, everything's okay. Fortunately, I had everything set up last night because I did go to um, the Ohio DEW site and it looks like that is down um, or was down first thing this morning. So I think we're in good shape though. We have, I have everything we need and we can move forward. Um, but I'm sure you guys can all relate to how those kind of things just are not the, the way you want to start your morning. <laughs> um, so we're going to talk, cover this morning um, EMIS, um, some common errors, um, everything about the end of year submission, um, and, and talk about wrapping things up for yet another um, fiscal year, which is crazy. And I'm sure you guys are, you know, deep, knee deep in fiscal year and like everybody else, um, like we all are. So I appreciate you guys taking time this morning to, to hop on. Um, so on um, our SSDT meetings and trainings page, um, the, the PowerPoint that um, we're gonna cover this morning is linked here. Um, and then, you know, just like every other Fridays with Fiscal session that we ho host um, after, we'll post the recording and that will be posted and linked here as well. Um, before we hop on the PowerPoint, I did want to point out that for the um, staff and course submission checklist, um, that actually has been combined. So if you go under USPS and EMIS connection, looks like we forgot a T there, I'll get that fixed. If you click on that, because really basically, you know, this is one submission, you know, the staff and course collection is, you know, the L um, collection in the data collector. It's just, there's two different times this collection is submitted, the initial. And then if we scroll down, this is what we've combined and added, you know, to um, the initial checklist um, that we've added the section for the final staff and course collection. So really, if districts have been doing their due diligence all year long um, and keeping all that information accurate and up to date, um, you know, there's just a, a few components that are reported at the end of the, the school year. Um, and not included with the initial that they'll need to, you know, review, add, and make sure that those pieces are in place. So rather than having two separate checklists, we've actually um, included that into one. Um, so that's, if you're looking for um, that final staff and course checklist in a separate spot, like it used to be, um, I did want to point out that's, you know, no longer the case. They're combined and and together now. All right, let's move on then to our um, PowerPoint. And this is kind of, you know, what we're gonna base everything that we're talking about um, this morning on. And a lot of this, you know, I apologize if it's, you know, basic and redundant for some of you that, you know, have been doing this for quite some time, but for those of you that are, are newer, um, to um, the ITC world, you know, and even EMIS, I think just understanding, you know, terminologies, you know, how, you know, the data collector sees things versus, you know, the USPS side of things and how those um, differences in, in the terminology that both sides use, you know, I think that can be sometimes um, confusing. So we're gonna put those pieces together um, so again, you know, the EMIS acronym 
for the different components that get reported um, during the L collection, the CI record, the CK record, the CJ record, and the CC record. So what do those even mean? You know, on the state software side, the CI record means the employee record. The CK means the position and also the compensation. And then our CJ records, the contractor records, you know, those are found under EMIS entry um, under the contractor tab. And then the CC, the contract only record, um, again, those are located in the EMIS entry um, area under the EMIS contracted service um, tab. So just to kind of, you know, put those pieces together, um, how we, you know, each side sees those. The first thing that I, I would encourage all your districts to be doing is running those EMIS reports. So generate the, EM, the employee report, generate the position report. So these really should be run as many times as necessary until they're air free. Um, before you go any further or districts go any further, we wanna make sure that these two reports do show zero errors. So if I go to the instance here and I go under re um, reports and I go to um, EMIS reports, you can see here there's the employee report and the position report. And I've already run this these reports for um, this particular district. And you can see, if I look at the position report, everything looks good. So I'm good there. However, if I look at the employee report, and if I would scroll all the way down to the bottom, I actually have two errors. So really districts are not gonna want to go any further if this report is, sh or either of the reports are showing any kind of errors. Now, you know, we all know the re the error on the report um, doesn't make much sense. Um, so basically they're all gonna state the same thing that they need, this record will not be reported. Um, basically contact your ITC for help. We are aware that this is, you know, it put, kind of puts the burden um, on you at the ITC. Um, and, you know, there isn't currently a an exact replica of per debt per se um, that we have available, but that will be coming. Um, there is a JIRA issue um, out there for that. And I think I've even linked that in the PowerPoint. So we'll, you know, just touch base on that in a bit. Um, but what you can do at the ITC um, to help your districts actually decipher what might be wrong or what's airing out on these records is um, doing a little debugging, so to speak. So out on, again, on our meetings and trainings page, um, I can go there so you can see it. Under the ITC only support resources, we actually have put together a checklist that's called debugging EMIS report errors. And this steps you through what steps you can take at the ITC to actually get the details of what the error um, is actually meaning. Um, so what will need to happen is you'll, you know, go, we'll step through the, the process just to kind of get you comfortable with how this all works. Um, you'll actually go to system and then monitor. And again, this is all spelled out in the checklist. So this isn't something you'll have to take note of and, and remember. But if I go to the tab that says logging and under name, I'm going to type the, the word EMISR. And then you kind of have to be particular as to where you click in this um, field here. And I always have to click a couple times. And if I double click, you can see that it provides a drop down. And normally this would be just blank. We're going to change this to debug and click save. Now, when I run those um, two reports, or in this case, since just the one had the error, I'm going to rerun the one that had the error. If I go back to system and I go to monitor 
and I now go to the app log, I can actually then see that when I ran that report, it kind of debugged what the problems were. And I can see here at list the employee, the position, and what it didn't like. So there is no hours per day for this employee on position one. There is no active comp compensation for this employee and this position one on position one. So it gives you pretty much, you know, a good clue or, you know, areas to go to, to, to actually, you know, point you in the right direction to, to um, clean up that air. Just remember, um, you know, once you're done with the whole debugging process, we do recommend that you go back to system, go back to monitor, go back to logging, and then again, just double click and then make turn the debugging off. Um, the de developers have said that, um, I think I have to click off, sorry. Um, oops, <laughs> my bad, I turned the wrong the wrong one off. So I need to search for EMISR again and then click, um, turn that back off. Probably shouldn't do that for this. Not sure what that was. Anyway, um, so that will help, you know, you help the districts, you know, point them in the right direction as to what that error is truly meaning. Um, so then you're gonna run, you know, clean those errors up run that report or those reports again, um, you know, until that those errors are, those reports are air free, then the district can go ahead and, and submit to the, the data collector, okay? Another um, helpful uh, tool that we've put into place, um, actually, let me bounce back to the, um, PowerPoint here, I'm getting ahead of myself. So that's using the debug and running those two um, EMIS reports. Um, we, like I said, we do have um, a feedback issue to actually create a, a replica of um, Classics per debt report for those of you who are around for Classic days. So um, eventually, you know, you're not gonna have to do that extra work that you um, have to now. Again, once the those two reports are air free, now we actually some are ready to submit the information to the data collector. And from this point forward, you know this is where districts are going to use their level ones that come from the data collector to to look at errors and review those errors um, before they actually submit their collection. So. When it comes to errors in the data collector, um, we, you know, there are obviously, you know, there's the, the EMIS manual um, that gives you the different sections um, that, you know, the diff for the different records. Um, when those level one error reports come back, they're in the description field, there's actually a code um, or a record um, type listed. So this can be super helpful in the fact that where do I even begin to know, you know, maybe I'm not familiar with where the education level is pulling from. So what you want to do is, and we've highlighted this here in the PowerPoint, um, in this example, is actually go to that specific section in the EMIS manual and search for this code here, and that will take you to that specific section in the documentation, and it's going to give you all the various options then that are valid. So if we would go to, in this case, it's the CI record, and then the code is 100. So if I go to the staff records section in the EMIS manual, I'm looking at the CI record. This is where fortunately I had all these open <laughs> this morning because the system was down when I tried to access the um, 
their website. So anyway, so if I search then, if I do a control F and I go and I type that CI 100, it takes me then to all of those occurrences of what I'm searching for and tells me then, you know, the valid values. So I need something, you know, zero through nine in that field. Now, on the SSDT side, you know, this is all well and good for when it comes to, you know, the collection side. Um, we've actually put together an EMIS level one errors explanation um, spreadsheet. And this can be found, if I go back to um, the under the USPS and EMIS connections um, chapter, there is an option that says EMIS level one errors explanation. So if I open that, this takes me then to all of the errors that districts could possibly receive in the data collector. We've broken this up by the record type. So CI, CK, CJ, and CC. And if I scroll over, well, let me start from you know left to right. So you're seeing the data collector error, the severity, the code that's being displayed um, on the actual um, report, a description, an error message. And then if I scroll to the right, here's where we've added the column that says the state software location. So if I, again, look at that CI 100, which I could do a find on, but I should be able just to scroll down here. Let me do a search for, I can't remember what our ear was, I'm sorry, education level. So yeah, so right here's the, if I could, if I would have searched CI 100 again, um, you know, it would have taken me to that specific um, line seven, and we can go over to the state software location column and see that if we go to the employee record under state reporting, it's the degree type. Okay. So hopefully it's kind of, you know, Putting the pieces together, so to speak, you know, you know what the error is on the in the data collector, but where do I go in state software to fix that or find what that error is, you know, relating to? So hopefully, um, this will be helpful. Again, that's been separated. You know, don't forget about the tabs down below. Um, it's been separated by the different record types. This is something that, you know, we're going to have to maintain at the SSDT level. So we're trying to stay on top of, you know, all the changes and, and so forth and the different errors that ODE, sorry, I keep saying ODE, DW might be putting in place. Um, so, you know, bear with us. This is something we have to maintain, you know, on our end in conjunction with um, DW to, to make sure that this is current and up to date. So. Hopefully that will be helpful um, in kind of putting those, you know, those pieces together. All right. Let's move forward then um, into some areas that um, are areas of difficulty, some things that can be particularly confusing. Um, and again, I think a lot of times it comes down to like the differences in the terminology. So you know, on the state software side of things, we use hours in a day. EMIS uses the length of workday. Um, state software uses contract workdays. EMIS uses scheduled workdays. Um, state software uses pay unit. EMIS uses pay type. And uh, lastly, state software uses contract amount. EMIS uses pay amount slash rate. So, you know, just knowing, you know, how to, again, connect the dots. And, you know, when when we're talking about one thing in the software, you know, what is EMIS looking at to, to know what 
information it's pulling. Um, under each of these areas, we have outlined then where to go um, to find or you know how, where the where the information is pulling from um, when it gets to the data collector. So hopefully, you know that trail will help um, put those pieces together as well. All right. When it comes to then the hours in a day, or as EMIS refers it to it as the length of workday, um, we're just gonna step through then those areas that we just touched upon that can kind of be confusing and, and walk through what the software is using to pull that information into the data collector. So if there is a value entered in the on the position record in the EMIS related information in the hours in a day field, that is what's used for the length of, of workday. If there is not a value entered, then it uses the compensation hours in a day. So remember any of those quote override fields on the position record, those are used, they, those take precedent. So those are gonna be used first. Um, and hopefully you guys all know where those are um, by now, but just to point them out, if we go to a position record and we open one of these up, um, this EMIS related information section, these are the fields that we're talking about. So the contract amount, contract work days, hours in a day, and FTE, these are considered override fields. I know a lot of districts have even changed the names or you, maybe you at the ITC have helped them change the names so that they don't say the same thing as the regular uh, compensation fields do. So they might you know, have been changed to be more meaningful like EMIS override contract amount, EMIS override contract work days and so forth. So those can also, using those custom fields and making those um, be more meaningful can also help, you know, the district understand the difference. So feel free to, to do that if you think that will be helpful for them. All right, so when it comes to the contract work days or scheduled work days, um, if there is a value, again, entered on the position record in that contract work days field, that is what's used as the scheduled work days. If there is not a, a value entered on the position record um, in that workdays field, then it you know, diverts to the compensation and uses the job calendar as the scheduled workdays. So it's going to look at the compensation start date and the stop date and look at the, the calendar that that compensation is assigned to to look up those days. And then keep in mind that if there are um, any, if there is a value in that extended service field, then that amount then is subtracted from the amounts above to actually arrive at that final count. Not sure how much that extended service field's used anymore, but. Um, keep in mind uh, when it comes to non-contract compensations, I know these are these can be troublesome to get reported correctly, um, but there's basically two ways to report those um, accurately, and one is to assign that to a job calendar. Um, I'm not sure how frequently that happens. Um, a lot of times you're using a non-contract compensation because they don't have a regular work schedule, so um, you're probably not assigning a job calendar to that. Um, in which you have to use option two um, and use that EMIS related um, information field, that contract workdays override field that we just talked about, okay? So jumping back up to the, you know, if you're assigning the, a job calendar to this non-contract compensation, then um, the date range is determined using the start date from the configuration fiscal year. Um, so that EMIS reporting um, configuration, how that fiscal year is set, or the compensation start date, if it is after 
the EMIS reporting fiscal year. So if that's after July 1st or whatever fiscal year is in that configuration field and a stop date um, is determined from either the, the configuration fiscal year or uh, the compensation stop date it is, if it is prior to that, um, you know, June 30th of the, the fiscal year that's um, entered in the configuration reporting year. All right. I know, clear as mud, right? This stuff is such an exciting way to end our Friday. <laughs> All right, moving right along to um, the, the pay unit um, or pay type as EMIS sees it. Um, this is actually just set as an annual salary or an hourly rate. Those are the only two options. So the default is set to annually. However, um, the system does go through a series of checks then to determine if that should be set to something you know else like the hourly rate. So it's calculated based on the contract amount, the hours in a day, the work days, and the pay unit in the following order. So you know if the contract amount is greater than zero, then the salary type is going to be set to annual. If the pay unit is set to hourly, then the salary type is hourly. If the pay unit equals daily and hours in a day are greater than zero, it's also set to hourly. And then if the pay unit um, equals daily and work days are greater than zero, it's set to annual. So if there's any other combination of, of anything that we just talked about, then that's going to produce an error um, and, you know, that will need to be fixed. But if, you know, districts do have this type of error, then maybe go through this chart here and kind of determine where, you know, what's missing um, and, and that, that it can't find to, to do its calculation. All right. If there is a value, I'm sorry, when it comes to the contract amount or the pay amount or the rate, if there is a value entered, again, in that override field, that contract amount field, then the value um, is used as the pay amount or the rate. If there's nothing in that override field, um, then it defaults to the contract amount on the compensation record. So just a side note, um, you know, again, those non-contract compensations in order for the uh, contract amount or the pay amount to be um, reported correctly or something to be reported, those always have to be entered in that EMIS override field um, in the contract amount field. Otherwise, it will, it will produce an error. If there is no pay amount found, then the system um, will uh, set the pay unit to hourly, and then the unit amount, the hourly rate, is what's reported. Um, if the pay unit is, is equals daily and the hours in a day are greater than zero, then it goes through a calculation to know what pay amount to report. And that's the, the daily rate divided by the hours in a day. If the pay unit equals daily and the contract workdays are greater than zero, then it's gonna take the daily rate, again, divided by the hours in a day. All right, so that's kind of a lot of just reading off of slides and I apologize, um, but at least hopefully having this, you know, put to paper, so to speak, um, will put, you know, answer any of those questions that you might have when it comes to helping um, I your districts, you know, research why they might be getting the errors on any of those four areas. So again, this is just a chart then um, that's, it's, 
you know, putting those two together basically um, to determine whether um, the salary, the contract amounts reported and whether it's an annual or whether the unit amount, um, the salary type is hourly and the unit amount is, is reported. So this chart just puts those two together um, and kind of, you know, spells out how those two will get reported and, and how they're calculated. All right, when it comes to absences and attendances, this is another area that um, seems to be um, a, a pain point, so to speak. Um, just keep in mind, um, we get questions all the time. We have an employee that one position compensation is reported to um, EMIS and the others are not checked. And we don't understand why you know, there's an error. Keep in mind that all the absence and attendance information is handled at the employee level. So it does not matter whether those EMIS check boxes are marked or unmarked on compensations, okay? It's all handled at the employee level. So if the employee is set to be reportable, you know, that EMI report to EMIS checkbox is marked, then it's going to account all the absence and attendances. And those are what are included in the EMIS, you know, in the collection. Um, absence and attendance records are counted if the record is assigned to the compensation and the activity falls within the fiscal year range. So if you have absences and attendances that, you know, you do not want reported, then, you know, add a, a calendar stop date using the a date prior to the first attendance record posted. And that's kind of a way to trick the system and get around um, reporting those if they should not be. But again, just keep in mind, this all happens at the employee level. Um, it does not matter if compensation, you know, those reports EMIS boxes are checked or not checked. So other um, areas to consider are the termination date on the position record. So, you know, this is used um, when it calculates the, the um, days from the work calendar. Um, if the position job status is set to terminated, then the stop date used to find the days on the calendar will be set to the termination date. So it's gonna stop counting, you know, once that, once the, um, the days on the calendar reach the termination date. Um, if no position um, termination date is entered on the position, then the employee termination date is used. And then if no termination date is on, on the um, on the employee, then the compensation calendar stop date is used. It keeps going. If no compensation calendar stop date is entered, then the, the compensation stop date is used. And finally, if none of these dates are entered, then the system is going to use the um, EMIS uh, reporting configuration, the fiscal year that's entered. So June 30th of whatever year is entered in that field. Okay, so just keep in mind, I know that um, we have had some questions about termination dates um, and how those are used in conjunction with, you know, the, the stop date of when the system stops counting those absences and attendances. All right, when it comes to hourly employees, um, the hours actually have to be converted to days. So the system needs to know how many hours are in a day. And that's why it's so important to have a value on the in the hours per day, hours in day, I'm sorry, um, field on the compensation record. So even those non-contract non compensations, 
You know, you have to have a value in that field. So this first bullet here um, is, it's gonna use that out on the compensation. It's gonna look at that hours in a day value um, that is assigned on the attendance record. And if, if that, if that uh, value is provided, if there is no compensation assigned, then the system's gonna look to find the first active compensation. Um, and that they use it uses the compensation date range to do that. So the system's gonna look for a compensation where the absence and attendance activity date falls within that date range of the compensation. If there is no um, hours in a day value on the compensation, then the system's gonna look for that override value in on the position record in the hours in a day field. Um, and again, if there's if it's not found in either place, that's when an error is returned. So, um, you know, that's most commonly, you know, why your districts get the errors they do. Um, and hourly employees are particularly confusing, I understand. So, you know, look for these two first two bullets. Um, again, you know, if there's if it's not finding, a value to do that conversion, then there's gonna be an error. Um, and just a, a kind of a little side note here, if there's no compensation assigned, then the system has to you know, find that active compensation and it does the compensation date range to, to do this. So it's gonna look for a compensation, um, you know, where the, the compensation, the activity date, I'm sorry, falls within the date range of that compensation. So kind of repeating what we had above. The system then simply does a, a conversion of the length of absence divided by the hours in a day. So again, it needs to find that hours in a day to do that conversion. And that's why sometimes you see those astronomical, you know, absence, attendance figures um, being reported in the data collector because it's it's doing that length of absence divided by the hours in a day and either that hours in a day is missing and you're going to get the error or it's something obscure you know something greater than a day so it's it's that value um, or those days that are that the are pulling into the data collector are really inflated um there are times where sometimes, you know, the, the attendance and absence records are, are accurate. And rather than, you know, going through hoops to get it reported correctly on the EMIS side of things, um, there are um, two types under core adjustments um, that you can use to get those days and absences reported correctly. So there's the EMIS attendance and EMIS absence. So those two can be helpful um, for districts to just get those, you know, figures reported correctly yeah. and, and not have to go through um, a bunch of hoops to get that done. Just keep in mind the transaction date does have to fall within the, the EMIS fiscal year. So that's what it's looking at um, when it when it grabs includes those adjustments. Another thing um, or another tool I should say that can be helpful um, in just collecting, uh, maybe districts have you know made some changes and um, before it gets to the data collector, they want to know, you know, does it do things look good? Um, what's it reporting? They can actually use that report entity count summary report. Say that 10 times fast. Um, it is a newer addition, so sometimes I think this gets forgotten about. Um, so, you know, encourage your districts to use this. Remember the dates, the ranges gets a it's a little, um, it's not based on the pay date. So the dates are based on the pay period date. So they're gonna want to use the first period beginning date in the first payroll of the fiscal year, and then the last payroll of the fiscal year's 
um, period ending date. Okay, so it's not based on the pay date, it's the pay period dates. All right. Moving right along then, um, long-term illnesses. Keep in mind that these are, you know, any days an employee have been absent for 15 consecutive days or more. Um, and those get reported in um, on the employee record under that state reporting in that state reporting section. Um, there's a long term illness um, field. Remember that these are a subset of the absences. So if you're putting, you know, if a district is putting in 50 in that long term illness field, there have to be 50 absences, at least 50 absences in order for their not to um, be an air produced. So those are a subset of, of each other. Just some quick, um, you know, kind of tips and tricks, things that we've um, kind of learned along the way that if there are errors, um, the first thing I encourage districts to do or, you know, go to that, EMIS configuration option, is it set to the correct fiscal year? Hopefully at the end of the fiscal year by now, you know, they've already submitted once um, for that initial collection. So that should be correct. Um, you know, moving into the next fiscal year, a lot of times this does get missed. Um, so probably not as they have to happen now, but um, at the beginning of the, the new school year um, that gets missed and not switched. So um, also go to um, the, go to system configuration, EMIS configuration, is the ZID prefix entered? Again, probably not super likely that, you know, that's not been um, entered by now, but you know, if, if there are problems relating to um, that area, that's somewhere that can, we can go to, to make sure that um, something is entered there. Is a credential ID a valid number of characters? There are times where there's a space that gets entered um, in, inadvertently. So that is going to air out because it's not going to be a valid number of characters. But if you have an employee, you know, that is airing out on their credential ID, you know, look at those in like Notepad++ or something to make sure that there's not a space um, in that uh, credential ID that's that's causing the problem. Dates, um, the higher date, the birth date. Um, there are times where the system, you know, is not able to catch incorrectly entered um, dates as it stands now. We do have um, a, an issue in place, and I've included that here to validate date properties so that that doesn't happen. But there are times where, you know, like 2223 might get entered. So there's an extra character um, in that year field. And obviously that's incorrect and gonna air out. So if there's a, a problem with a date, you know, open that up again and make sure that, you know, there's not an extra digit that's causing the problem. When it comes to uh, additional resources um, in um, a, you know correcting errors, um, I just wanted to point out that the um, DW does have new new EMIS coordinator training um, sessions. Um, so if you go out to and I think I have this open here, hopefully, yeah. If you go out to their website, there's under EMIS training, it lists all the various presentations that they're that they offer. Um, there's like I just mentioned the new EMIS coordinator training session, and looks like it's still down. There's even um, a, a session on just the data collector itself um, that will would be super helpful. So, you know, encourage your districts to go out and take a look at these. 
Um, I know, you know, looking at listening to videos, nobody has a lot of extra time to do that. But um, if they would take the time, you know, if they're new to um, EMIS or their role um, with the district, they might find these to be super helpful. And I, you know, I think a lot of times these get overlooked and um, people don't even know they, they're out there, um, you know, at their fingertips. We also have a couple presentations that um, have been done in the past. One was done at the um, 2022 OETSA conference. So if you go out and you view the details for um, prior conferences and you click on the EMIS staff reporting session that Teresa Williams and Sandy Spar did, um, this is super helpful in um, EMIS tips and tricks and correcting some you know, errors. So that can be helpful as well. Um, there are also the OECN United Conference um, in spring of 23. There was a session done um, by uh, Fred Burns and Missy Velasky at Omarisa called the Collaboration is Key to Six Success Session. <laughs> um, so that also might be um, you know, something that, that will be helpful. Uh, um, as another resource. And then obviously we have our uh, USPS documentation, um, the checklist, we have the quick reference sheet, um, the field names and location, as well as that spreadsheet that I just mentioned. And then lastly, obviously we're always here. And, um, you know, I do encourage like any, you know, how is this supposed to be reported sort of question, you know, direct that to um, DEW because they're they're the gurus in you know how things are supposed to be reported um, and then if you get that information you know back from them or if your district does and you need help you know getting it set up in the system correctly um, you know obviously we'd be more than happy to help but those how to's and you know how those sticky situations are to be reported um, you know they're the ones that are most knowledgeable in that area and, and can um, point you in the right direction as to um, how to how to get that information, how it should be reported. Just a reminder then that the final L collection closes, you know, August 7th, if I looked at that date right. Um, so districts will have to have their submission, you know, for the final L collection submitted on or before August 7th. And we will have um, a, a, another training session on August 9th um, to discuss the new fiscal year and getting ready for um, that initial, you know, L collection kind of starting things up, getting, getting your district started on the right foot as the new fiscal year um, starts um, so that'll be on August 9th. And I, before we wrap things up, I guess, are there any questions on anything that we covered? I know it's a lot of like reading off of slides to try to get you that, you know, how the information is calculated or, you know, what the system is looking at. So I apologize for that, but there's really not an easy way to, to point all that out without just spelling it out. So, you know, if you have situations that come up, with errors and so forth, hopefully you can, you know, refer back to this PowerPoint and, you know, see, oh, that's how, you know, the system is, what the system is looking at, how it's arriving at what, you know, it's, it's um, collecting and so forth. All right. Well, thank you, Heidi. I hope, I hope it's been helpful. I wanted to point out before we wrap things up, a change in our, um, a couple sessions that we have um, coming up. And let me get my bearings on where we are here. Okay, July 26th, um, there's been a slight change in our, the material we're gonna to cover. Um, it is dealing with ESS. Um, however, it 
was to be um, on timesheets. And that piece isn't quite in place yet for, or you know, ready to go into extreme detail um, and cover yet. So um, Michelle and Mary are actually going to cover um, the ASAP integration um, piece with ESS. So just a slight change. Again, it's still ESS related. It's just um, a, a little different topic. And then later on August 23rd um, is when the ESS timesheet preview um, session will take place. So just to make you know you aware of those change in um, dates and and what sessions will be covered. Um, again, you know, again, still ESS related, just a different topic. All right. I don't think there's any questions. Um, don't see any in the chat. I want to thank everybody for taking time out of their crazy time of year. I wondered if I'd even have anybody <laughs> on today. So I appreciate those of you that that took time to do so. Um, I hope everybody has a, a great end of their the rest of their fiscal year. Go smoothly and a great weekend. Thanks, everyone.